Good morning, everybody, and welcome. Uh, I'm Casey Carroll. Thank you for joining us at the Center for Teaching Excellence, our webinar, How to Propose a Global Learning Experience. Today's webinar facilitators are David Cardenas, Laura, Laura Ducate, and James James. So please join me in welcoming our webinar facilitators by typing welcome or hello in the chat box, and we'll switch us over to the slides. Hello, everybody. Um, the title today is How to Propose a Global Learning Experience. My name is David Cardenas. I am the Associate Dean for Academic Programs in the College of Hospitality, Retail, and Sport Management. Uh, I'm responsible for all of our academic units, undergraduate and graduate programs, um, student services, uh, academic integrity, um, alumni services, corporate engagement, and also international programs. So I'm excited to be with you guys today. Hi, I'm Laura Ducate. I'm the Faculty Executive Director for the Center for Integrative and Experiential Learning, and um, we approve experiential learning opportunities and also run graduation leadership distinction and generally encourage experiential and integrative learning across campus. Thanks. Hi there. Uh, my name is James Jaycox. I am the Administrative Coordinator for Global Carolina. So my role includes working with our faculty and staff across the university to ensure that our international education priorities are communicated and facilitated properly. Uh, so thank you to everyone who joined us for our last session, What is a Global Learning Experience? And we can go ahead and uh, do a quick recap of that um, that session for, for those of you who didn't have a chance to make it. Um, so we, uh, you, you can access that uh, lesson at any time on YouTube. If you just search U of SC CTE, you can go through the whole library of uh, previous sessions and you'll be able to find that there. So in the last session, we were able to see Elizabeth Koenig from Italy at Banffy Winery, and we also experienced their 360 virtual tour. We dove into the brief history of virtual programming over the years uh, with Sunny Coyle and more. And more recently, uh, at our university, we discussed the requirements of a GLE and uh, what the pilot in May kind of looked like. And we discussed other universities supporting virtual experiences and how they compared to what we are doing. We went over the student benefits of GLEs. We discovered partners on and off campus uh, that can support GLEs. And every time I say GLE, uh, you should think global learning experience. Um, we love our acronyms and I wanna make sure that everyone knows exactly what's going on. Um, so, in addition to today's session, we encourage you to attend the final session, uh, which will be on April 1st, uh, and that will be a hands-on workshop for uh, Global Learning Experience syllabi, so we can, uh, we can get to work on building those um, for you. So in today's session, we are going to go over uh, departmental expectations for GLEs, Requirements for GLEs guided by the Center for Integrative and Experiential Learning, uh, CEL, and education abroad, the Education Abroad Office. So um, we're also going to talk about the proposal processes and the timeline for submitting these global learning experiences. Just let me go ahead and introduce David Cardenas here while he talks about uh, departmental approval. Hi, everybody. Again, my name is David Cardenas, um, Associate Dean in, in HRSM. So I want to talk a little bit about the departmental approval for our faculty-led programs. Um, so uh, just to kind of, um, just to let you guys know, all of our uh, curriculum development, um, no matter if it's an international program or a traditional class, we want to make sure that they follow all the same standards um, so that, they, that we make sure that there's academic rigor, they, follow, they match all the learning objectives. So um, like all of our courses um, uh, there and, and all our curriculum, it's faculty led. Um, so no matter if it's a face-to-face uh, -face class, online class, uh, faculty led international program or GLE, um, it's critical that it's a faculty led and guided program, meaning that, um, that there's some kind of foundation for that faculty member. It could be uh, expertise, it could be 
um, in, in, a, in a content area. It could, for our international programs, it could be the connection to a um, to the community or the international community um, or uh, scholarship that they might be doing in that area. So again, um, all of our programs are um, driven by our faculty, and um, and we think that that's critical for its uh, to make sure it's sustainable. Specifically for our faculty-led programs and for our GLEs, um, we want to make sure that the faculty member has a, um, a clear connection to the content that's being taught as well as the community. For example, uh, myself, I have a, um, a program that we do in the Galapagos, our USC in the Galapagos program. Um, and um, the, the reason that, that I'm doing that is because I'm from Ecuador. Uh, so I have a clear connection to the country. I was born and raised there. I understand the community. Um, and my area of discipline is tourism. So uh, it's a, it's, we think that, that, that because I have an interest, it's going to make sure that it's more sustainable. Another example would be our, our faculty member who does a, a faculty-led program to Iceland. Uh, he's not from that country, uh, but he has a, a content uh, area that, that's closely associated with that. He's visited the area very uh, closely, um, and he has a lot of contacts in that, com in that community. So again, um, we want to make sure that it, it is, it's faculty-led and, and guided. Um, and also, it helps with making sure that the approval process goes uh, much easier because they're more motivated to work on, on getting that approval process started. So um, uh, typically, the process takes 18 to 12 months to, 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 to work out all the approval processes, and we highly encourage members to get started early um, with that process. Uh, once they get it uh, started, they, they need to meet with their department and or school to make sure that it's the right timing for for what they want to do. Um, uh, they need to make sure that the goals align with the goals of the college and or the department um, and that uh, there's no cross duplication. For example, we have quite a few faculty members in our college who uh, work in Italy, um, either through tourism, uh, food and beverage, uh, retail. Um, so we want to make sure that there's not cross duplication um, each year or, or each semester um, and that uh, faculty members, we can rotate which faculty members travel when and where. Um, after it gets approved at the departmental level, then it goes to comes to me, and I also review it, uh, making sure that it ma matches our goals and objectives within the college. We also want to make sure it is a, a country or a region that we think is going to benefit us from a rankings perspective or maybe help us with our scholarships so that we can expand that uh, and or uh, we want to develop new international programming. Um, and then we also to see if there's any cross duplication. Um, you know, we have a limited number of students who are going to be able to go on these international programs. Um, and we want to make sure that, that all the programs are then viable. Um, and then the last process would then make sure that the, the dean um, knows that, that, that it's going on, that he or she approves it. Um, and then if there's any disputes, for example, if a faculty member feels like they was, uh, that, that it was un unfairly uh, denied, that they have the ability to, to have a mediation process, um, which actually happened with our first GLE that we'll be talking about in a few minutes. Um, so again, um, the, the process for departmental approval, very similar to any traditional classes. Um, uh, all classes have to be pre-approved. So if we're going to be offering a, um, a marketing class um, as a faculty-led program or as a GLE, it has to be first approved as a marketing class. Um, and then we, um, we then modify that uh, for that international experience. So specifically, the example that we uh, that I want to be able to give to you guys was one that we had last summer. Um, so just to, just to let you guys know, I'm by far not an expert on GLEs. Uh, I first started learning about it uh, last year at this time uh, when COVID hit. Uh, we we were uh, we were pretty much told uh, in March that we weren't going to have faculty led programs. Yet we wanted to have um, we wanted to make sure that our students had had a a, a global experience. Um, and Magdalena reached out to me um, and said, you know, asked me if this is something they would be interested in. Uh, and it was definitely a learning process. Uh, so I'll tell you a little bit about what happened. So in March, when all of our uh, faculty-led programs were canceled, our May master uh, classes were canceled, uh, we had a few faculty members who were interested in going uh, the GLE uh, route to make to, to give our students that uh, international uh, experience. Um, so the approval process is similar. Um, we it was still we wanted to make sure that it was faculty led. We wanted to make sure that the faculties had 
um, had that expertise. Um, they still had to go through the same approval process. And because it had been approved as a faculty-led program, much of that had already been taken care of. Um, we, 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 we were uh, we knew that it had it met um, the academic rigor. We knew that it matched our learning objectives. Uh, we knew that it, uh, there wasn't any cross duplication between other units. Uh, so that uh, approval process was was very very similar. Um, and I would say 90% of what we would do for our faculty led programs are also something that we do for our GLEs. The only difference. Uh, really is that um, uh, is the budget and safety and security uh, because they're not actually traveling uh, that's not necessarily a huge concern uh, for our students um, and that the the we wanted to make sure that the budget that that, that was being approved uh, was also um, you know, because they're not going to be traveling, because they're not going to have those ty types of experiences um, that that met the criteria for the, for the class that we we wanted to do. So we had two classes that were uh, initially submitted. Uh, both of them were in Italy, uh, a luxury management program. Uh, this was a well-established program that we've been doing for many, many, many years. Uh, the classes were pretty much co-taught by two of our faculty members. One it was in retail management, um, and then the other one was in wine and culture and hospitality management. Um, and the, um, the retail management program was approved by the department chair. Um, and however, the hospitality and tourism management program was rejected by the department chair. Um, once it, uh, uh, so, so when it came to me, um, I approved the retail management program. Um, and then um, the, the faculty member in hospitality and, and tourism management appealed the process and um, to the dean. And the, the, the dean uh, decided to, to uphold the retail, uh, the, the decision by the hotel, restaurant, tourism management faculty. Um, so we only officially offered the retail management program. Um, uh, the reason why uh, it was, uh, one was rejected and one was approved uh, was just because of the, I, in my opinion, uh, because of the newness of the program and because a lot of the uncertainty of what a GLE was, um, the and, and I think we're going to be talking about those scenarios in a few minutes, but I'm just going to kind of uh, um, talk just a little bit about that. Um, the, the the retail faculty member felt like that because they were experienced faculty who had been there before, um, it was it was uh, worth being approved. However, the uh, hospitality faculty member or hospitality department chair uh, believed that um, that that it was m misleading that it wasn't going to provide that international experience and that students uh, were not going to be as engaged um, and that they shouldn't be having that as those, those additional costs so that's why he he rejected it at the time so um, I think we're going to go to the next part and uh, James and I are going to talk a little bit about scenarios uh, yes so we I'll I'll go ahead and um get into the first scenario, which is uh that a stakeholder might tell you that a global learning experience is not study abroad. Um and we recognize that GLEs are not traditional physical travel. Um but and we we still encourage students to seek out physical traditional travel uh if their situations allow. But, you know, right now, in, uh, in a time of, um, I think it's an understatement to say, limited physical travel, uh, we've got lower student budgets to invest in traditional programming, and we also have general inaccessibility due to a variety of student needs. Um, GLE still allow students' minds to travel, if, if we want to think about it that way. Uh, so... In a uh, the conversation article titled "Here's a New Way to Do Study Abroad During the COVID-19 Panic and Beyond," uh, the author outlines, among other reasons, uh, that U.S. higher education must accept that there are other ways to educate students beyond the way it is done in the U.S. Uh, while the desire to ensure academic integrity is understandable, demanding that international courses be just like the ones already offered in the U.S obstructs students from encountering other ways to teach and learn. Um, so virtual international coursework then allows for students to still receive the benefits of international travel without needing to physically go. And there are other, um, there are other reasons to do virtual international education as well, 
uh, if, if you think about accessibility in terms of if someone has specific dietary needs that might restrict them from going overseas, then a virtual program would be appropriate for them. Or if someone has work or family obligations uh, at home and but still wants to experience international education, then virtual programming would be uh, appropriate for them. Um, David, do you want to move on to the next one? So, yeah, I just kind of, you know, I think for that first one, the, 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 what I tell my faculty and tell my, the administrators is, no, it's not studying abroad. You're right. It isn't. We're, they're not studying abroad. However, it has benefits. Um, and there are many great um, things that can come from this. As you mentioned, a few of these, um, you know, it, it provides opportunities for students who may not have the ability to study abroad, maybe because of a disability, uh, maybe because of cost, or maybe because they're a student athlete, but it doesn't mean that it just still doesn't have value. Um, so no, it's not going to be that traditional studying ab abroad, but it does give some um, international exposure and provide some globalization. And it can also be a, a catalyst for them to study abroad, for them to feel comfortable um, uh, in the future. So no, it's not the same thing, and, and you just have to get past that. And we're not, we don't advertise it as they're studying abroad. It is a global experience, um, um, and it is a it is a pathway for them moving forward. Definitely. Um, so the, the question of how much is this going to cost uh, depends, just like it does for, for traditional travel. Uh, a pr the program fee can be entirely non-existent if we use pre-existing international partnerships, personal connections, and collaborative teams across the campus. Um, but if we're going with a third-party logistics provider, then we have seen the total lump sum of the program cost be between $1,000 and $2,000. Uh, which is generally suggested to be split evenly among the students. Um, so that means that with even just 15 students per course, the fee equates to about $100 per student. Um, and with our special pricing for in-state tuition, a small program fee, and our education abroad fee, students have a significantly smaller financial burden with GLE programming, and they still receive the benefits of a globally focused course, uh, those benefits being experiencing international cultures, uh, thinking critically in ways that they haven't had to before, and all the other benefits that, that come with international education. Yeah, this was one of the biggest uh, sticking points for the fact the department chair who decided to, to not approve this program as they felt like the cost didn't uh, wasn't worth the, the experience. However, um, the, the students are still getting, they're still having the same academic rigor that they would for a regular course. Um, the, an online class, um, they have to still follow the same learning objectives as they would. Um, and as James said, the costs are, are minimal. It'd be very similar to buying a textbook or uh, buying a, 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 calc a, a scientific calculator for a math class. Um, the other thing about this that we were very deliberate about is that we allowed students to use their travel scholarships for this experience to offset this cost. Um, so we were we we talked to our donors to to tell them this was an experience. So they were still able to offset the cost of this class uh, through our travel scholarships, which I think was very 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 beneficial for them um, for them moving forward. Um, and in some respects, it it was lower lower cost than it would be for a traditional class. Um, and one thing that I'm that I'm very grateful for so for what Magdalena did uh, early on was to get it approved to be an in-state tuition, just like a regular um, uh, rec regular faculty-led program. So uh, co cost can be much less expensive than a traditional online class or even a face-to-face -face class. Um, so um, so the our, for us in our college, the costs were less expensive. Definitely. Um, so the where's the engagement question I see as being related um, to the first question of asking, you know, what is study abroad? And the engagement with these virtual courses comes through the reflective uh, practice that comes with uh, experiential learning requirements. We talked about those in the last session. Um, but the, the same requirements that come along with any experiential learning course can be applied uh, even more so to uh, global learning experiences because students are being asked consistently uh, to reflect on how the um, events that they are engaging with virtually can apply to their own experiences, can apply to um, 
the way that they learn, the, the way that they think uh, just culturally. So the engagement with a global learning experience is definitely um, something that the faculty leader can, can focus on in, in really constructive ways in a virtual space. Yeah, and, and as James said, it goes back to one, it isn't studying abroad, so it's not going to be the same experience. And with like any with any course, um, it's what you make of it. It's as, as engaging as the faculty member puts into it. Um, one of the one of the great things, um, when students finished the class in May, last May, their, their, their GLE, uh, one of the students' comments was, I felt like I was there. Um, that that made me feel very very happy um, because they felt like they were they were part of that community. Um, they they uh, they had some great engagement um, activities. Uh, one of the things that the students did um, was they had a a live uh, um, they they were able to to have a live session with. Um, community members in Italy showing them a plant uh, for leather working. So they were actually in the plant to see how uh, they were they were able to use leather and transform leather into um, different retail purses and 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 um, and jackets and things of that nature. So they were able to see that live. So they had that experience and they got to see that um, uh, firsthand. Um, they were also they also did uh, virtual tours of the different museums in Italy. Um, so, so they 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 were engaged. No, they they didn't get to wake up and go to sleep in, in Italy and and eat the food there. What they were they were there, even though they did. Part of the requirement was that for them to eat Italian food here. But um, so it was. It really depends on how innovative and um, open-minded the faculty member is to com coming up with engagement opportunities. But again, it's not the same thing as study abroad. Exactly. Um, and finally, we have the possibility for your program being rejected. And that's inevitable no matter what program you are um, kind of bringing to the table. But we encourage you to keep trying even if your program gets rejected by, uh, by your college. Um, you know, the, the college can, can reject courses for, for any number of reasons. And we anticipate that as global learning experiences continue to become more normal, you know, this this international health situation, it's not going away as quickly as um, as it could be, really. And that's going to continue to make virtual international education kind of our primary uh, way of engaging with it in the near future. So um, I'd, I, I would say that it will be less likely uh, for your college to reject a, a global learning experience outright just because it's virtual as we get more used to the concept. Yeah, and that that's just part of the process. You know, we, as, as James just said, any class can get rejected. One of the things that I highly recommend is start at the education process early. Uh, because it, it is new, oftentimes uh, there's not a lot of early adopters who will, will, will uh, take this on. Um, and then also find an advocate for your program um, to help uh, 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 push it through, um, you know, and you know, talk to people in in the education abroad office. They're 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 great, and they'll talk to any of the faculty members, any of the administrators, um, and I'm happy to talk to anybody. So you can ask me, and 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 I'll reach out to your dean or associate dean or department chair. Happy to explain to them um, what, what the benefits of it and and how we went about doing it. So there's always a chance, uh, but it, it's always worth giving it a try because I think it is a beneficial and it has a place for our global education. Okay. So with these scenarios in mind, we can move on to discussing experiential learning at uh, the university uh, in general. Um, so let's see, I believe Laura Ducate will, uh, will discuss this with us. Yes, thank you, James. So I'd like to contextualize these experiences a little in terms of experiential learning opportunities um, here at in Columbia at USC and also in the Palmetto Colleges. I see there are a few people here from Beaufort, and this may not apply to you in the same way, but hopefully this will give you some ideas about how to answer the engagement question. So this ties in a little bit with that. So currently I'll study abroad, including global learning opportunities, count as experiential learning opportunities which means that they also need to fit these requirements that are on the screen right now. 
And just as a reminder, um, experiential learning opportunities go on students' My U of SC experience extended transcript as a record of what they've done beyond the classroom. And they can then share this co-curricular transcript with employers or future grad school to show their engagement and what they did while they were um, during their college career. So these are the requirements for an ELO, an experiential learning opportunity, and hopefully seeing these, you might even be reminded that you have other courses that would fulfill these categories. Um, we're always looking to, to get more ELOs in our database. They're tagged in banner. So if students are looking for a course with a substantial beyond the classroom experience, they can find them pretty easily and then they'll be on their co-curricular transcript. So we look for a minimum of 45 hours of engagement where students are applying what they're learning in a real world context. And some of these 45 hours can include preparation for that experience and reflection. We look for clear expectations of what the students need to be doing. And again, reflection. So reflecting on what they're learning in different ways. It could be um, through the class, um, everyone talking together about reflection. It can be a project, a paper, presentation, journaling, one-on-one -on -one meetings, just any way to help students really think about what they learn during the experience, what they would maybe do differently next time, how it connects to other experiences they've had, how it might help them in their future career. And then feedback. So we want to make sure there's a substantial feedback coming from the instructor or the grad student who's working with them, but so students know what's working well and what they maybe need to improve on a little bit. So those are generally the um, expectations for an experiential learning opportunity. And it's similar for a global learning experience. With the global learning experience, to get back to sort of that engagement piece, we really look for 25 hours within that 45 of real world experience. So David gave a few examples from the course that he was talking about to where the students went to a leather factory, they went to a shoe museum, they interacted with native speakers, they went to a winery. Um, so we really wanna see 25 hours of students actively engaged in the, in the country where they are. Um, they maybe have the chance to interview someone, a native speaker of that country, somehow interact, interact with them, um, but that they're actively engaged. And then again, we look for reflection and feedback, and then some kind of culminating project where students have to take everything they learn. So they think about what they learned from the leather factory, the shoe museum, visiting the winery, and then put all of that together in a culminating project. So in that course, for example, um, those students had to put together a tourism plan for um, re recovering from COVID. So they took all of their experiences from all of those places that they visited and thought about, okay, how can, what can these different organizations do now in light of recovering from COVID? So they're applying what they've learned, analyzing, evaluating to build a new whole. So here's a few examples of these culminating projects. And even if you're not thinking about experiential learning opportunities or trying to get credit for that, I think this is a good way to have students really wrap up this experience so they they can put everything together and sort of solve a new problem. So you could have them do an essay where they synthesize their learning to form a new concept or idea, or revising some kind of process, they can write a business plan, examine a problem, develop a plan for action for a community. So I lead a, a study abroad program that focuses on sustainability, for example. So I have had my students think about, okay, we go to Germany and we think about sustainability in the context of Germany. So when they come back here, they could think about, well, what were people doing in Germany and how could we maybe apply some of that in Colombia? So even if they didn't physically go abroad, they can still think about some of those things. And then here's the example I talked about um, that David mentioned from that course, develop a post COVID-19 business recovery plan for a firm or a hotel or a business. So. Hopefully this gives you a couple ideas um, that you can think of how to fit your context, but just trying to get students to bring it all together in some kind of culminating project. So for us, for my office, um, this is one piece of what could fit into graduation with leadership distinction. So this is um, experiential learning. We also think of lots of different experiential learnings fitting into the larger um, 
concept of integrative learning. And so once students complete graduation with leadership distinction, they've been encouraged to connect all of their within and beyond the classroom experiences over the course of their time at USC. So if you do end up um, putting through a, a GLE and have your students participate, I wanted to just put graduation with leadership distinction on your radar as well, because this that program would fit towards students um, GLD. So I wanted to make sure you're aware of this so you could also encourage your students to participate. So hopefully you all have heard about uh, GLD. This is an official academic distinction, acknowledges what they've students have done within and beyond the classroom and it's recognized on their transcript and their diploma. And you can see in this picture, they also get honor cords at graduation. So there are five different pathways for GLD. Um, anyone have any idea of what one of those pathways might be? Do you want to write it in the chat? This is your uh, a little quiz. Like, oh, community service, <laughs> yay, okay. So we've got community service, diversity and social advocacy, global learning, Thank you, Jack. Professional and civic engagement and research. Yay, okay. Sometimes it takes a minute to, uh, for, the, for the text, for the chat to come through. So these are our five different pathways for GLD, and really there's one that's most applicable to um, what we're talking about today, which would be the global learning pathway. So just briefly, so you sort of see how, how this global learning experience fits in. For the core experience for a global learning pathway, we want students to have completed 12 weeks of study abroad or eight weeks of faculty led or six weeks of faculty led plus 60 hours of local international experiences that would vary according to the student. Um, and now that we have started offering these global learning experiences, we will allow two weeks of that to count towards that eight weeks of faculty led study abroad but we really still want students to go abroad for the other six weeks as we feel like that's an important part of this pathway. So they also need to participate in three enhancement experiences, which could be attending presentations or workshops or job shadowing. Um, they need to take six credit hours, so two courses of GLD approved courses, and they do a presentation, which normally happens at Discover USC. And then the final component is, an for many students, the most difficult is the e-portfolio. And this is where the real integrative learning takes place. So this is where they articulate what they learned in their beyond the classroom, their within the classroom experiences, and find the connections between those experiences and come up with three insights about what they learned. And then they do a leadership section. And the leadership section is really to show how they're a leader in their field. So they've had all these experiences they found the connections between them, and now they are uniquely qualified to solve a problem based on these insights that they have developed. So for example, we had a student who took a course on homelessness, and she volunteered at the transition shelter. Then she went to China and worked with homeless mothers, and she put all of these experiences within and beyond the classroom together to form her insight that victim blaming is universal. She saw it in China and in the US, and is fueled by a lack of understanding and sympathy. And this led her then in her leadership section to think about ways to be, be an advocate for the homeless on a legislative level. So that's just an example of how all of these experiences come together for students um, within this e-portfolio component. So that's just a brief overview of GLD in the context of GLE, and ELO, get in all our acronyms um, in case you do have students who, who want to use their global learning experience to count towards graduation with leadership distinction. So that's it for me. Thank you. I'll pass it along. Great. Um, so before you even propose a GLE, there are some questions to think about uh, in order to help guide you through the process. So. Uh, on our Blackboard organization, you can find steps to lead abroad. So these pages are geared towards our global classroom projects. Um, but most of the process will apply to GLEs as well. Um, so first, you need to decide which course you can foresee converting to a GLE. Uh, this could be a course that you teach already, or it could even be a global classroom that you've proposed in the past. 
As David mentioned earlier, you will need departmental approval, uh, so just be sure to check in with your department chair and dean. It's going to be proactive during these early steps uh, to show your college leadership that you're serious about doing this. Um, so during these planning stages, you will also want to determine if you will be working with a third party logistics provider, um, either that or uh, international agreements with your department are an option or any other connections that you can think of. Um, as we saw in the pilot, uh, the university leaders' prior connections allowed them to put together uh, free synchronous and asynchronous materials, but ultimately this required more work on their behalf and from the office. Uh, it still means that students were able to participate in the course without a program fee. Uh, if you determine at this point that you would rather work with a provider, then there will be some sort of program fee for your students. Uh, Third-party providers obviously aren't going to do this for free. Um, you still want to visit our budgeting page on Blackboard uh, for more details. There's lots of useful resources there. Um, you should also start thinking about how your syllabus will change. We've talked a lot about um, integrating virtual international education as well as thinking about graduation with leadership distinction um, uh, aspects to it. So you definitely want to keep all those elements in mind as you begin to build your uh, global learning experience proposal. Um, so after you complete step one on Blackboard, and this should be slide 16 of, of 18, um, you can move on to step two, which includes actually submitting your proposal. Um, in the proposal itself, you will need to answer some logistics questions, uh, such as what course you're proposing, dates of the program, program fee, all that. Um, and since GLEs are not programs that physically travel abroad, you will not need to upload any kind of insurance enrollment um, or submit a detailed emergency action plan. That is a benefit of, uh, of, of doing it virtually. Um, so you, you still are going to need uh, a signed program leader agreement, uh, which indicates your department's approval uh, as well as your syllabus. So your program will be sent through our typical review process. Um, so our, our typical review process, uh, it, it occurs through uh, OPAC, which is our Overseas Programs Approval Committee. Uh, it's, OPAC is comprised of various faculty and staff across campus, uh, and they evaluate each program's academic uh, health and safety and international components. So during the review process, if OPAC does not find that they can approve a program, they offer suggestions and ask questions to guide uh, faculty through the, the various means of, um, of fulfilling their requirements. So in addition to the typical OPAC review process, you are also uh, going to need to clearly indicate that your proposed course meets the requirements of that 25 hour minimum uh, for experiential learning that Lara talked about uh, as accomplished through mandatory and possible activities. Um, and the benefit of doing it virtually is that those 25 hours can be uh, a combination of synchronous and asynchronous, meaning that you don't need to plan 25 hours of synchronous uh, experiential activities for your students. You can, um, you can have your students do some reflective writing and, and add that into your 25 hour uh, total. So, the Blackboard GLE guidelines uh, has a table that you can insert into your syllabus to showcase your experiential activities directly. Um, if you choose not to use the table for review purposes, you will want to include uh, the same information on how you add up to that 25 hours in your syllabus um, or potentially submit an additional document. That just depends on your organizational needs uh, and preferences. So. We suggest that you allow for about six months between the proposal and the start date. So uh, being proactive is definitely a benefit here for you. Um, Education Abroad accepts GLEs um, for May Mester uh, until January 15th, but you all aren't going to be worrying about the May Mester. Uh, you can look at our deadlines uh, on the Education Abroad website if, if you need further um, information about that. 
But this timeline is important to keep in mind, especially if you're going to work with a third party provider. Uh, and we want to make sure that the timing just works out uh, and bringing in a third party provider does inevitably complicate things. So um, this is all that we've got for you today. Um, but I want to encourage discussion uh, as, as much as possible uh, before our final session, uh, which again will be happening on April 1st. And our final session will be much more collaborative in nature. Um, but we just wanted to make sure to give y'all um, as much context as, as we can. So we can just go on to some potential questions. And if y'all just want to type out your responses um, in the text box, uh, wherever appropriate. Um, so these are just some some start off questions for, for y'all to, to to get your your heads in the in the right space. Um, but one that that is interesting to me and, and maybe that we can start on is um, how we can integrate language learning through a virtual setting. Um, so what are what are our thoughts on that? This is one thing that you are going to want to keep in mind as you design your virtual experiences. You want to think about ways that you can encourage uh, your students to engage actively, um, not even necessarily during your synchronous sessions either. There are ways that you can use Blackboard to encourage um, regular discussion posts reflection posts, interaction uh, between students. Um, and the benefit of that is that you can also talk that up to uh, experiential learning requirements. Uh, you can say that students are reflecting um, in, in that way. And with language learning, it could even be as simple uh, as having your students um, sign up for Duolingo in, in whichever language you want to use and having them uh, post their results. Duolingo has um, a really great um, way of, of gamifying language learning in, in such a way that you can set up a leaderboard with your students and have them compete directly with each other for a high score if, if you want to take that route. Um, but the, I, I would encourage you to do some research into uh, tools that you get w through learning virtually um, because we are inevitably moving toward a virtual international education um, system in the future. Uh, COVID-19 has swung the doors open for virtual and swung them shut for in-person travel, at least for now. Um, and while that has not been a positive experience, and I don't want to try to make that argument, I don't think anyone in the world would try to make that argument, uh, it has opened our eyes to the possibilities of virtual international education. And there are lots of tools that you can use virtually that aren't necessarily available to you if you do an in-person uh, experience. Um, but let's see, David and Laura, do you all have any kind of closing thoughts? No, I hope you all have, have gotten some ideas for for how to put together one of these um, experiences. And I think it is a great opportunity for students who wouldn't normally be able to go abroad to still get some of that intercultural communication and gain some intercultural competence. So hopefully we will have this option for students in future years. Thank you all for being here. Yes, uh, same kind of just to echo what Laura said, you know, I, I'm here, we're, we're all here for any kind of support. So if you guys need some help, feel free to reach out. Um, this is not for everybody, just like every class is, there's, there's, there's classes that are meant for some and it's not for others. So um, this is just one additional option for our students. But if you do need help, we're here to help out. Um, good luck and um, uh, hope to see more of these GLEs in the future. Hey, we Thank you, Casey. And thank you, everyone who joined us today. <laughs>